Welcome to Fun with Annuities with your host, me, Stan the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent. Can annuities be fun? Can contractual guarantees be fun? Absolutely they can. Find out the brutal facts about annuities with no sales pitches or high pressure nonsense. Just the brutal and factual annuity truth, which is all you need to hear. Let's have some fun with annuities and let's have that fun start right now. Welcome to Fun with Annuities. I'm your host, Stan, the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent licensed in all 50 states. Really excited about today's program. We have multiple guests on. Typically, it's just one guest. Now we have two, which is fantastic. There's so much IQ in the room, I need to just leave because there's a lot of smart people here. Uh, one of the guests has been on before. His name is Steve Vernon. He, um, he, we're going to have links to his site, restoflifecommunications.com, restoflifecommunications.com, all one word. Um, he's a consultant. He's an expert. He's an academian. Um, he's just an all-around good guy, but very, very smart. But today's topic is going to be a great one because he's brought a guest on as well. Her name is Naomi Karp, and she is an elder law attorney, and she also is a consultant nationwide on aging law and policy, which is very interesting with my group that follows me and my client base, et cetera. They're mostly baby boomers, and baby boomers are kind of rolling into that um, chapter two of their lives. And um, I think this is a very, very good topic because we're talking about cognitive loss, potential cognitive loss, and ways to go about combating that from a standpoint of risk of financial loss. So I'm going to have their site. They have a great site that uh, I'm going to point you to called thinkingaheadroadmap.org, thinkingaheadroadmap.org. I'm going to put that link on our site as well. But let's just jump in with a question. Naomi, Naomi I'm, going to, I'm going to ask you first about just how, how your path has led you to this very interesting specialty. And in a world of demographic tidal waves where 10,000 baby boomers are hitting age 65 every single day, actually more than that, Tell, tell us kind of your background as being an elder law attorney and how that has transformed itself to being a consultant on aging and the policy that affects that. Can you give us a little background there? Sure, and I'll try to make it short. Um, <laughs> but since I'm a bo baby boomer, I have many years of experience. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm right there with the population we're talking about. Um, so many, many, many years ago, I went to law school because I wanted to be a public interest lawyer. I wanted to do, use the law and policy to do good in the world. And for the first 10 years of my career, I was a legal services lawyer, which means I represented low income and older people who okay. couldn't afford lawyers in a variety of civil matters, not, not criminal. And during that time, I kind of became specialized in issues of older adults and there are a whole spectrum of issues you know some are the same as younger adults you know maybe they're getting evicted or maybe they need some kind of public benefits but you know they also get involved in advanced planning for the possibility that they might become disabled or incapacitated in some way which is going to lead to where we're going today mm -hmm. um, you know lots of issues that particularly impact older adults. Uh, at some point in my career, I moved to Washington, DC, which is kind of the heart of policy and policy making and advocacy and research. So I switched from representing older adults directly and worked more on a kind of system level on issues everywhere from social security and, and Medicaid and end of life decision making to elder abuse and financial exploitation and scams and all of that stuff. And so in my career in Washington, I worked for two nonprofits, uh, including AARP, the big kahuna. Um, and then it, the very last part of my full time work career, I worked for a new federal agency that was just opening its doors called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which mm -hmm. became, some people know of it as uh, 
It kind of came out of an idea that Elizabeth Warren once had, but then mm -hmm. Congress passed the Dodd-Frank Act and the agency came into being. And it was specifically mandated by Congress to have an office looking out for the financial protection of older Americans. So I spent eight years there. It was fantastic setting up the office and putting out tools and publications and you know, things for older people and for all the people who interact with them, everything from banks to law enforcement, et cetera. Uh, so now the past um, almost three years, I've been a consultant and I do work for nonprofits and government entities and private entities and so forth. And here I am a couple of years ago, was able to meet Steve and then a third partner of ours Marty DeLima, we all had a connection at that point with the Stanford Center on Longevity, and then we got to this project, and I'll, I'll let it go there. That was probably more than you needed no, to. No, that's, that's, that's wonderful, and I'm glad you, you, you gave us that background because uh, in the past, I had done some work with Elizabeth Warren's office. They contacted me about an article I wrote a long time ago, and we were trying to eliminate the incentive trips and things like that within the annuity industry. Um, and she wrote a very good, I helped uh, with the writing of a very good report. And, and obviously it got kind of stalled a little bit because the insurance industry is pretty tough from a lobbying standpoint, but, but have been in those trenches with you on trying to protect seniors out here because it is, uh, there's, it's like chum in the water and, and blood in the water. I mean, they're, they're circling and it is bad. Steve, I want to jump in with you because um, there are risks of financial losses due, due to cognitive decline. What have you and your associates found and what's, what's glaring to you that's happening right now? Well, it's pretty clear, uh, both professionally and personally, because I've gone through this with my parents, as has Naomi. Mm -hmm. So we've seen it firsthand with our relatives, but also seeing it uh, out in the world. You know, you get into your 70s, late 70s, 80s, 90s, and um, Let's just be frank. You're just quite not as sharp as you used to be. Sure. And of course, the age varies according to each person, but it really is the case that you're more vulnerable to simply making mistakes mm -hmm. or uh, being exploited by unscrupulous relatives or friends. It may not be illegal, but it, it might not be the best in your interest or even outright fraud. And so uh, we really see the need for preparing for this inevitability for a lot of people. And it's real natural. I'm, I'm in my late 60s. It's like, oh, that's going to happen. That, that'll never happen or that'll happen sometime in the future. Right. The best time to plan for that is when you still have all your, your wits intact and to put safeguards in place later to be triggered when you might need them. Because what will happen, we, I've seen this all too often, instead of this preparing for it, some event happens where the senior, you know, gets defrauded or makes a mistake or has a big mm -hmm. loss, and then their adult children swoop in yeah. and clean things up. And not only is that a big mess, and their losses have already occurred, but when the kids are making decisions for you, they may not have your best interest at heart. Not that they're trying to mess you up. They just can't get in your head and know what you'd prefer. <clears throat> Correct. And so I'm, we're saying have the senior take charge of the plan and develop the plan now to be triggered when you need it down the road. That's Naomi, really the difference. Naomi, Naomi, how prevalent is this type of risk? And um, I, I know this is kind of a broad question, but how much can seniors lose? Um, I don't know if that's answerable, but I'd rather you address the prevalency of the risk um, and the other thing that I'd like you to talk about is we all have egos and we all have, um, you know, there's some embarrassment issues when you do make mistakes or you have been taken. How are you looking at that and how do you talk to seniors or have seniors address the fact that they're not firing on all cylinders, you know, at the end of life or as they, as they go through chapter two? That seems to be the toughest thing because when I have that conversation with my clients, I'm like, listen, you're, you're an A personality and you're, you're kicking it right now, but there will be a time that you will not be. So we might want to plan on turning uh, some of the investments into turnkey type investments. How prevalent is this risk for seniors? 
Okay, so we're really talking about a few different kinds of risk here. So okay. I don't think I can give you one number for any of these, but let me sort of throw out a few things that I think all feed into it. So, so Steve talked about the different kinds of risks that we're trying to protect against. So it could be mistakes that just happen because you are starting to have some kind of cognitive decline, or it could be the outright um, fraud or financial exploitation. So when it comes to financial exploitation, um, there have been some really good studies that have shown that the, you know, the prevalence of financial exploitation, even let's just talk about financial exploitation by a family member or someone mm -hmm. you know and trust, you know, is probably around 5%. That's okay. pretty big. And then you add in all the strangers, frauds and scams, you know, that could be someone in another country. It could be someone who you think is romantically involved in you, who you met online, who is actually not even a real person. They're just such a broad array of kinds of um, financial exploitation and fraud. So, you know, then we could be getting up to, you know, one in 10 people or even more. The studies are not that, um, necessarily that reliable it's a really hard to drill down on that and you mentioned the issue of embarrassment that mm -hmm. makes it even harder Correct. so you might you know a great academician might do a study and someone might be too embarrassed to admit that this actually happened to me mm -hmm. or um you're doing a survey and you're not necessarily even getting at the people who already have the cognitive decline if someone has alzheimer's you know they're probably not going to be answering a, a survey uh, so it's hard to get your hands around a number, but we know the numbers are big. And then you asked about, you know, how much can people lose? People can really lose a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, it could be somebody losing 50 bucks in some little online scam, or it could be someone losing all of their life savings. I mean, we have horrible stories of, um, I mean, I'll just give you one example from mm -hmm. like a million different types. Um, let's say someone convinces uh, a relative or a friend or someone in their community to name them as an agent under power of attorney, mm -hmm. giving them a whole lot of authority or to put them on a joint bank account. Let's say, oh, it'll be so much more convenient for you. That person then has the means and the privacy to go in and just wipe out those accounts. So yep. we have people losing millions of dollars. We have people losing hundreds of dollars. Depends how much you have. It might be your whole life savings. And we always say one of the real dangers here is that when people are up into their later years, and especially 80s and 90s, when these things are probably even more mm -hmm. common, um, or even 70s, you're not in a position to earn it back. You can't replenish that nest egg that you had. So that's another reason why it's so dangerous. Um, I think you asked me more, but it was a lot of questions in that, one. I, I appreciate you. I know I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this topic. And Steve, before I, I've got a question for you, before I, I, I go further on that, I wanted to just read something from their site, which is think, thinkingaheadroadmap.org. Roadmap I'll have that link. But it says one in five people aged 75 to 79 have mild cognitive impairment or dementia and this risk increases to one in two for people in their 80s now at that site they actually have something fantastic which is a roadmap that you can either download it or you can order a print copy there's all kinds of news there's a blog there's they do a great job and this is a site that you want to put as one of your favorites because what you're doing is you're piggybacking off off of these decades of experience with steve and Naomi and just their passion for trying to help and prevent seniors from from losing money. Steve, what should seniors do to protect themselves and, and, and their families and the money they work so hard to accumulate? Because we all know that senior citizens, however you want to define that, they control the majority of the wealth in this country. That's just the that's the bottom line. So what does that mean? Anyone in the financial services business targets them target might be a, a, a good or a bad word in this case we're talking about it from a bad word how do people protect themselves 
Well, Stan, uh, that's the heart of our Thinking Ahead Roadmap. And so on the website, we have something called Money Path. Mm -hmm. And it's a six step plan that seniors can follow to prepare in advance for the situation. And always we're trying to prepare in advance. Um, and so let me just quickly read the six steps. Um, one yeah. is choose a trusted financial advocate. And that's find someone in your life who can help you manage your finances when you need that help. And it can, for a lot of people, it might be their spouse, but if they pick their spouse, recognize that their spouse could be the same age. And Correct. So if you pick your spouse, it should be a backup, you know, like an adult child or someone else you trust. And uh, however, for lots of people, they don't have that. So you might have to get a professional. Lots to talk about in each of these steps. Um, but that's step one. Uh, step two is to organize your financial information, take an inventory, write it down, give people a roadmap to your finances. Because you can imagine, uh, just imagine if you're in a car crash and you couldn't talk, but someone had to take over your finances. What do they need to know? Um, and I think that also includes, let me interject here. That also includes sign on information, log on information, um, digital information, digital intellectual property, as they say. Um, don't forget that you need to you need to have that stored away in a safe place and also with your financial advocate having access to that as well. So number three. Right, right. And I'm going through these quickly. Our website has detailed sure. all these things. Uh, third is start a conversation with the financial advocate you picked because either the senior might be resistant. The advocate might be resistant. Commonly, it's, oh, dad or mom, you're fine. Right. You know, I'm busy. So you got to start the conversation. And then step four, once you've gotten through that initial conversation, is then just explain your situation, what you expect from them, what your goals are, what your values are. You know, we see examples of, of seniors who supported certain charities, but once their kids took over, oh, mm -hmm. that charity gets cut off. And, mm -hmm. you know, Again, it's just what are your priorities that you want? Now, the most important one, and here's where you want to talk to Naomi, is officially appointing your advocate under a power of attorney and making sure you do that in a legal way. And that's one of Naomi's many specialties, so I'll let her talk about that. Sure. And then the sixth one is to acknowledge in advance what the signs might be that it's time to shift. And the signs can either be subtle Mm -hmm. or they can be just wacky in the head, you know, like you had a heart attack or something like that. But whatever it is, have a plan in place because it's so easy for people to get to that age in life and still think they're doing fine. In fact, there's a graph in one of our reports that shows participants, the seniors' confidence in their ability to manage by age, and it's a flat line. They never lose confidence in their ability to manage their finances, but then there's the actual ability based on cognitive abilities of people that age, and it's a steady sure. decline. Sure. So it's real common for people to just think they're doing fine. I think if you commit in advance to say, oh, you know, when, when my driver's license gets taken away, um, that's a <laughs> sign that there's some frailty involved and feebleness involved. And there right. are many other signs, but just know them in advance and say to your, your friends and family, hey, when you see me, yeah, doing this or that, uh, bring that to my attention. On a side note, I recently, my mom lives in St. Augustine, Florida. She's getting ready to turn 84. And we made the decision that she doesn't really need to drive. She doesn't see as well. And we set her up on an Uber so that anytime she wants to go anywhere, it goes on my credit card. She can, she's got, and I said, you, you now have a personal driver. And so she's really enjoying the freedom of, of going when she wants to go. And we found out that she was not going out at night because she didn't like driving at night. Now she's going out with her friends at night because of this Uber that we set in place for. Her. So those are some signs that we saw and obviously, you know, um, in the financial business. So I've seen the other as well and, and protecting her. Naomi, I wanted to pivot and all of this comes down to most everything in life is communication, right? And good communication proactively. But I also want you to weigh in from a legal standpoint this isn't some do-it-yourself situation. You really need to have a partnership with a very good um, you know, elder law attorney. Do you agree with me on that? I actually do agree with you that on that. We had a lot of conversation when we were developing the roadmap 
Um, and, and I will mention that a lot of research went into this. So mm -hmm. before we actually, even though we were all experts in one way or another, before we actually sat down and created the roadmap, we did a bunch of expert interviews with professionals as well as older adults and caregivers. Mm -hmm. We focus groups with different segments of older people at different ages. Um, we did something called an online community forum we were, where we actually had 120 older people for a two week period who came online every day and we gave them, we threw out questions and exercises and it was wow. like a giant chat room and we got just all kinds of help from them about, you know, what their thinking was, how we should message it, what words resonated for them, what words were a turnoff. So there's a lot uh, behind this. But getting back to your question about mm -hmm. uh, the elder law attorney, we did struggle with the issue of, you know, we didn't mm -hmm. want our tool to be sort of the Full Employment for Lawyers Act. And then <laughs> there are a lot of people out there who think, oh, getting a lawyer, it's really expensive. That's so complicated. I don't know who to go to. Um, and in some cases, those things might be true. In many cases, they're not true. Right. Um, but over all of my years working on these issues and especially working on things like powers of attorney and trust, mm -hmm. other kinds of legal arrangements that people put in place. Sure. I really learned that you have to do it right. And if you download a form from the internet or, you know, you use some free whatever that somebody's out there to kind of hook you into getting sure. their services or whatever, you may not be doing yourself a favor because A, these things are governed by state law. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure the document that you create is valid under your state law. And that could even be simple things like your state might require two witnesses or they right. may, may not require it to be notarized. You need to know that. But your state law, let's say on power of attorney, is going to have other provisions about what kind of clause should or shouldn't be in there. Also, it really needs to be tailored to you. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a different situation. Sure. Some people think, oh, I hardly have any money. You know, if anything, I have a little money in the bank. I have my social security um, income and I have debt. So why would I need a lawyer? You know, I don't have anything. Well, it's just not true. Everyone's situation is different. You're right. You might, you know, so many older people own a house or some real estate, so they might be house rich and cash poor. There are just a lot of nuances here. Everyone's family situation is different. So yes, I generally do recommend that it's advisable for people to see a lawyer when it comes to something like making a power of attorney, making sure the power of attorney is the right document for them. If they have complicated finances, maybe they have property in other states, they own a business, whatever, it could be that a trust may be something they need. And you can't, we can't answer those questions generically. Those are the kinds no. of so you need some individual advice. Um, you know, so we do recommend, you know, shop around, get recommendations. You can call several lawyers. You can find out what they would charge to do something. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're eligible for um, some free legal services in your community. So sure. lots of ways to go. Well, and it's just like medical advice. You don't do it yourself with medical advice. It's the same thing. And this is as important. Um, and what I found in my 30 plus years in the business is lawyers that choose the elder law track are different people. They are, they, they use their mouth and their ears in proportion. They listen. And this is a customizable situation. Steve, what are the roadblocks? I mean, this could be a roadblock, the, the finding the lawyer and maybe that's a, it shouldn't be a stopper for people, but what are the other roadblocks and challenges that seniors face looking at this. It's a tough issue for people to look at in the mirror and think about it, but it's one of those things where we need to, what are they facing there? What are those roadblocks? Well, uh, let me start with, I'd say the emotional and psychological roadblocks is that yeah. people are busy. And yeah. this is a risk that might not happen for many years. It's like, oh, okay, I've got other things that are more important right now. And so to me, the biggest risk is just, 
ignoring it, being complacent, assuming that it won't happen. I agree. So I like to say um, there are a series of critical decisions as you transition into retirement. And this is one of them that you need to pay attention to as part of that transition. And think of it, uh, so somewhere in, you know, your mid 60s, uh, late 60s, early 70s at the latest, that's kind of the zone in which you should focus on it. Um, so anyway, that's, that's one risk that I think is probably the biggest one is just complacency, I'll do it tomorrow. But then once you get beyond that, um, other risks are, uh yourself thinking it's not necessary like we've talked about right. or the, another one is finding a financial advocate um for some people it's a natural they've got an adult child or a spouse or somebody but others don't and so it might take some searching to find someone uh another family member or if you have to pay someone that you know that's that's another risk that people face is just getting the right person in place. Could, could there be a situation, and I, I ask this more from a corporate setting, um, and you have, you're, Steve, your extensive, extensive background in the corporate world, this should be, I, I, I'm dying to hear your take on it. Since if there's not one person, could there be a board of directors of your cognitive state? I mean, could you have three? Could you have two? In other words, instead of trusting one, maybe if you say, listen, you're the people that I trust and love, it can't be all family members, by the way, and you bring in, you know, a board of directors to oversee and have these conversations with, and maybe it's your lawyer. Have you seen that happen? Because I know they have a board of directors for my company, um, and it does work because you have some objective viewpoints coming from different um, expertise levels. What do you think about that? Well, I appreciate that. And yeah, work in the corporate world, I can relate to corporate board sure. directors, but the phrase I like more is developing a convoy of support is uh, a more friendly I like that. term I like that, that I like. And so, um, yeah, you might have one or two people who are handling your finances, but then if, you, if you're really lucky, uh, maybe you have some adult children who check in on you. Um, mm -hmm and are they're seeing you to make sure that you're doing okay so it's not just the finances yes. that's a critical part that's true but it can just be uh logistical support um and then maybe it's involving your neighbor across the street and say hey neighbor would have you ever seen me you know fall down in the street or something like that you know pick me up right <laughs> well pick me up but then call <laughs> who do you call you know? exactly yeah um and so it can just be building out that convoy of support. And I, it, so, and again, it's much more than just the finances, but definitely want to have the finances in there in that convoy. Hey, yeah, you Stan, definitely you I, need a team. Go ahead, name it. Yes. Yeah, just to jump in. Um, you know, we have talked a lot about, you know, whether should it be one financial advocate or should mm -hmm. it be multiple? And then, you know, especially when you're coming down to how you make it official with the power of attorney. Um, you know, people certainly can have more than one person. They can have co-agents. Um, they just need to be aware. They probably want to set it up so that um, whatever decision is made doesn't require the sign off of two or three people because that mm -hmm. can become very cumbersome. Maybe yes. that maybe you have three adult children and you love them all and you trust them all, but they're in three different states. One lives around the corner from you, but the other lives somewhere else. And I know we're now living in a virtual world, but yeah. still, you know, it's cumbersome. So when it comes to someone who might eventually be doing all of your finances for you, paying your bills, um, potentially collecting rent, applying for benefits, all of these things, um, maybe making transactions on the market, things might have to happen quickly. You don't wanna create roadblocks that didn't have to be there. So you could have people in an alternate position. Another thing you can do in something like a power of attorney is, let's say you wanna select one of your adult children, um, but you want everyone to feel included and mm -hmm. you also want to make sure that that person, you trust them, but you kind of want to verify that they're doing it right. You could actually write into a document like a power of attorney that that main person you have should give an accounting, let's say every six months to 
your other adult child or your cousin or your neighbor or whatever. So they're sort of accountable to someone. Sure. That really helps them keep good records and then communicate about it. And communication is, as we know, you know, ultimately so important. We want to avoid family conflict. So those can be good techniques as well. We're talking to Naomi Karp and Steve Vernon, and they have a site, they have extensive background, we could keep going on that all day, but they have a site called thinkingaheadroadmap.org, thinkingaheadroadmap.org, all one word, and we're going to have that link on our site, but I was, I was looking just at the downloads, you have free downloads, and I was just looking at some of the downloads. You have an example of a power of attorney, or tips to protect retirement investments and income and, it, and like a financial spreadsheet that you have you've laid it out so that people don't have to create the wheel here you've already done this and it's and it's free you can download it you can order the book i mean if you're if you're not a, a techie person they've set it up for you to do either or so you know of all the sites that i've seen in a long long time and i'm always searching for things that my clients can use as as something um, positive in their life. This is one of the best ones I've seen. And I know this is a hard conversation for a lot of people to Stan, are you really talking about cognitive issues? Yes, I am. You know, as a good friend of mine in the life insurance business says, one out of one of us is going to die. Okay. Which is a, not a good motivational speech, but true. But I just read you the stats, you know, about cognitive, cognitive issues. If you make it into your eighties, one out of two, so this is something that I know you don't want to think about listeners and viewers, but I need you to, I need you to lean in right here and connect with these two, listen to these two experts because they know what they're talking about. And it's time for you to, even though you, you will say to me, Hey Stan, I don't need this. I'm hitting it on all cylinders. I'm, I'm never going to, yes, you are going to lose it. You need to, you need to address this. Um, we talk about some of the signs that it might be time to transfer some of this, you know, um, responsibility, but um, can you go into that a little bit more, Naomi, about just kind of the signs and what people should be aware of? I don't want them to become obsessive compulsive about their cognitive abilities. If they lose their keys, I don't want them to fall off the cliff here because we all do that. But what are you, what would you give somebody from a pragmatic standpoint on how to, start thinking like this, or even not to wait until that happens and to be proactive now? Well, first of all, you hit the nail on the head with that last thing. You do want to be proactive now, mm -hmm. because as Steve mentioned earlier, um, if you get to a point where you are already making mistakes and you are already having cognitive challenges, whether it be mild cognitive impairment or dementia, full-blown dementia, um, not only won't you really be able to think through these things in the best possible way, but legally you won't even be able to put someone in place. You can't make a power of attorney if you don't have full capacity to understand what it means to make a power of attorney and how to choose someone and what kinds of things they can do. So you have to do it when you still have capacity. So yeah, doing it now is the thing. Um, when you're talking about red flags or warning signs that maybe that is starting to happen, you know, particularly in relationship to finances, you know, and we're not here to replace the, you know, psychologists mm -hmm. and the geriatricians and all the people who actually do these capacity assessments. We're just sure. talking more generally about, you know, what do people need to know? So, you know, things like, you're starting to make a lot of mistakes. They could be financial mistakes. They could be things as simple, and, and we see this all the time, uh, people forgetting to pay a bill. Um, let's say you don't have your, your utilities or whatever your monthly payments are on auto pay, and you just start forgetting to make those payments. Or sometimes people are paying it twice or three times. You know, maybe they're still writing a check, they send a check, and then a couple of days later, they send a check again. So memory issues, forgetting to do things like that. Um, and it could be things that aren't financial. You know, you're forgetting doctor's appointments, you're forgetting yeah. 
I mean, my mother who has advanced dementia now, she's 97, when she first started declining, there were two ways that I, and I was living 200 miles away from her, two things kind of set off my alarm bell that said, mom needs to live closer to me and we need to have more systems in place. One was she was starting to forget she would make a date with my cousin and then she would not show up. And then my cousin would call her and she'd say, oh, Judy, so nice to hear from you. Like no mm. clue that she was, Judy was standing on the corner waiting for her to go to the movies. Um, the other thing is she was starting to put things on the stove and then go in the back room and do something. Yeah. And then the next thing she knew, she smelled the pot burning. So little things like that, that can be kind of disastrous. Um, you know, it's things like that. Um, maybe you're making some bad choices with your investments. You're, um, you're falling for a scam. I mean, mm -hmm. people, when they start losing the capacity to handle finances, yeah. you start losing the judgment about what is legitimate and what isn't. And that's, that's been documented with studies. And by the way, the capacity to handle finances is one of the first kinds of capacity to go when sure. you start having cognitive impairment, you know, probably earlier than a lot of other things like making how to make healthcare decisions and other personal care things. It's the finances that often will go first. And I know that AARP, who you used to work with and for, Naomi, they've done a great job and they, they continue to address this issue proactively. Steve, I want to pivot and ask you a question about, we've been talking about people that are baby boomers and just things to be aware of, but there's a lot of people that are listening and viewing this podcast that are the children, uh, 40s and 50s, I don't know what age they are, and they're thinking, wait a minute, I need to start thinking about this with my mom or my dad or my uncle or my grandmother or whoever. And they're the ones to start that conversation. They're the ones to proactively make their senior loved ones aware of the risk and the challenges and, and start showing them the tools that you have provided on your site. Coach them through that a little bit because that's a tough one. Like if I walked up to my mom and go, you know what, mom, kind of losing a little bit. That's not the way to do it, right? I mean, she's, gonna, she's a Southerner and she's like, get out of my face, sonny. You know, this, who do you think you are? How do you, how do you gently go into that conversation, even if that person is not, you, you don't even think they're losing uh, cognitive ability, you're just trying to be proactive as a loved one? Well, thanks, Stan, for posing that question. And I've got some ideas, but let me just start with, if you're listening and you're in your 40s and 50s, mm -hmm. um, this could plop in your lap if your parents don't be proactive about it. Yeah. And it might plop in your lap when you're still in your career and busy or with your family. So that's kind of the motivation is that what we found is that people want to be independent in their lives and they don't want to depend on others. But most of the time family jumps in when there's a problem. And the family is the insurance company here, you know. So that's the motivation is that it could happen at your busiest time. So if you can motivate your parents or your uncles or aunts, uh, people in your lives that you know you would step in for if, if the chips were down, then start helping them be proactive. So back to your question, how can you kind of gently uh, get people to think about it? Um, maybe there's somebody in your family who's much older and they're starting to lose it and it's pretty obvious. So, you know that Uncle Harry? You can say to your parents, you know, Uncle Harry, he's not doing that well. And, oh yeah, and you start sympathizing and talking about it. And I sure hope he's done something to protect his finances. You know, it's, it's less threatening if you talk about somebody else. Good point. Than, hey, Mom, you're losing it. Good idea. So that's, that's one suggestion. Um, and then, uh, but then to get, start drilling down. Well, um, instead of saying, hey, mom, you're losing it, it could be, you know, I've heard, I heard an interesting show, Stan the Annuity Man had a great show about this and, uh, and said how important it is to protect your finances as you get older. And have you thought about that? You know, we found in our research that um, asking questions is far more engaging than directive statements. So asking a question, have you thought about how you might protect yourself 
when you get older. Um, then it doesn't put them on the defensive. It makes them, hmm, have I thought about that? You know, so at least those are, I'd say stories and questions are the two types of things that are really engaging to people. And I think what Naomi said earlier, which, which kind of popped out at me, there has to be, and this might be the lawyer in you, Naomi, but <laughs> there has to be protocols in place. And wh whether they're subtle, planned, um, and ongoing, there has to be protocols in place for you to be kind of checking off the boxes if you're the, if you're the caregiver, loved one, son, daughter, granddaughter, whatever. Because I think this podcast can be for the person that's listening that's going, yeah, I am a senior. I really don't have a lot of people around me and I probably be, need to be proactive with that. But I think bigger than that are people like myself um, that have my mom and I'm trying, and, and my wife's mom, and we're trying to be proactive. I'm not gonna tell you which one's more cantankerous uh, when we approach them about that, but one of them is not buying it. They don't want to uh, believe that they're gonna be needing that kind of help. And a lot of it, Naomi, I was gonna, Naomi, I was gonna ask you this. For the, for the person out there, the senior citizen that needs to address this and the third parties coming in, whether it's son or daughter, there's a secretive issue. There's a lot of people that don't want to reveal what they have, even to their family. What do you do there? Because, you know, if you're trying to be their advocate and they're only telling you about 25% of what they have and they got a bunch of bearer bonds stuck in the Bible on the shelf, how do you address that? Because that's got to be an issue as well. Yeah. So a couple of things. And that, again, is something we talked about a lot. You know, what if, what if you are ready to talk to someone about the fact that you might need their help later, but you're not ready to open the books? Right. And, that's, and we think that's okay. Um, it's okay to say, I'm not going to share all my finances with you now. I'm still fine. I'm handling it. But you got to give them something. So you yes. have to say, I've gotten it organized and I've got this locked drawer or, you know, I've got a password keeper online that'll, you know, get you. You have to give them a key to something, a lock box, a location of a drawer, hopefully not, you know, the Bible's on the third shelf. It's <laughs> something a little bit less, yeah. um, you know mysterious and hard to find than that but you got to give them just enough so that later when they really need the details they'll know where to find them but it's a hard it's a hard balance because we are part of our message is that we're trying to protect your independence and your autonomy as long as possible sure and actually the more you plan the more you are keeping control because you're picking the person who's gonna step in, you're telling them how you want them to do it when the time comes, you're telling them how you want your money spent and all of that, but um, you have to at least open the door and let them in part way. But I think people can do that successfully. I think that's a good way to put it. Steve, this, is, this, is, this dovetails into what we all describe as end of life planning but it's for whatever reason it's something that um just is hard one to bring up um but i think that you know the, we talked about the privacy issues and the ego issues and the embarrassment issues but what i want my listeners and viewers to re realize is there's eventuality issues as well this will eventually visit you or your family and i just naomi just keeps saying proactive please be proactive, put the pr protocols in place. And Steve, can you address the possibility of just the patience factor of addressing a loved one and just taking it in baby steps over time? Because I'm assuming you have seen that as well. Well, right. And, um, and actually I had something to add to Naomi's last answer. Please do, yeah, please do. Uh, here, I worked on this with Naomi and Marty and I, I couldn't, tell my son who's the financial advocate our account amounts just like it was just something made me want to be private and i could give them a, but i did give them a list i we have accounts here 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 and here here are the phone numbers here are the account numbers i just didn't put the amounts in there you know so that 
And I said, if you need it, you, know, you can call them, they'll tell you the amounts, you know? So I'm just giving that as one way to give them the information yeah. they need without yeah. having to reveal how much money you have in there. And that can go a couple of different ways. Some people Agreed. are ashamed at how little they have. Agreed. And others are kind of private. They don't want to show how much they have, you know, it can go either way. So I just wanted to share that. You can give that's, people- That's interesting. Um, and I think, I think uh, Naomi had a, a good idea. I th was talking about um, just putting some protocols in place. Like for instance, my mom, when my, when my dad passed away five years ago, we, she had really never been involved in the bills or the finances. She was the mom. She had grew up in the South, North Carolina. Nothing wrong with that, but uh, she just didn't have any um, experience. So we put all of the bills that we could on auto pay. Now what happened, which is interesting, you're probably familiar with this because you've done the research. There are companies out there, nefarious companies that will send multiple bills to seniors for them to pay. They'll send cards or, you know, uh, postcards to say, have you paid your bill yet? I, and my mom will call me and say, it's on auto pay, mom. Okay, tear that up and tell me who that company is so we can report them. Um, she, she kind of bristled a little bit when we did the auto pay because I think she felt like we thought she was pitiful. But now she's embraced it because she's like, well, I don't even have to worry about that because it's taken care of. Um, do you have any other anecdotes or stories that maybe can help the people out here that are listening to it relate to what you guys are trying to do? Well, and Stan, you just hit on a good solution um, to help convince people is it'll be easier for you. Yes. Um, now you still have to pay attention and auto pay yeah. is one of the worst things that when someone passes away, true. those auto pays keep cranking even though that person <laughs> stopped. That's true. That is um, true. But um, I think here's another subtle warning sign is that do you ever get frustrated talking on the phone with uh, people at the bank or your insurance company or having to deal with it online. Mm -hmm. Right now at this age, yeah, we deal with, we, we put up with it, but later some people just go, ah, it's booty and they hang up. That's a sign, but also it's, that's a sign that it might be time to start thinking about transitioning mm -hmm. or plan for it. But also it's a sign of how you can get them to buy in. You know, oh, if you don't wanna have that frustration of dealing with these folks, set up the plan now. Put it on auto pay. Um, and mm -hmm. it's not just the bills that can go on auto pay. Um, I, we talk about protecting your savings. Yes. And you, you can do a couple things to put your cash flow on auto pay, mm -hmm. like an automatic withdrawal from your investments into your checking account, almost Correct. like a paycheck you're paying yourself. Correct. Buying a nudie, which you might know something about. Yeah, we do. Have, we do have some. You know, I'll have some proactive spouses that'll say, both female and male, say, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and buy this annuity, joint life, just in case down the road we're not hitting on all cylinders. This money's going to be hitting the bank account. We're going to be okay, etc. Obviously, I want to them to get their loved ones involved. But yes, there are some investments, not just annuities, that that can be turnkey. Uh, in nature. I think what's interesting about both of you, and I wish, uh, hope to have you on again with Marty. Um, Marty couldn't be with us today, but um, it's just the philanthropic feeling of what you guys are doing. You've, you've established these things to really, really help. You both have successful careers. This is something that obviously is a passion for you. Um, where do you see this headed? What's the plan for thinking ahead roadmap. What's the plan for this? Because it, it needs, I'm going to blast it out as best I can, but where's it headed from here? Naomi, can you address that? Yeah. Um, and that is something that we've grappled with. And I, I've, you know, for my many years in kind of public service career, you think of a project, you do the research, you create the tool, you print it, you got the nice design cover, mm -hmm. you got a great website, whatever, and you're like, you're done. Well, no, you're no. not done. That's actually just, you know, the first step because if you don't get it out there and people don't use it, sure. it's worthless. So we've been giving a lot of thought to, you know, how do we really get this out there? Once people get their hands on it oh, yeah. and understand it, I think we're 
most of the way there because hopefully we have created in a way that it's understandable. We answer a lot of questions and a lot of things that people can do independently. Yes. But it's getting people, getting it into people's hands. So one thing that we're working on right now is uh, we want to make it easy for people in different businesses and professions and service careers to present workshops or, or classes on the Thinking Ahead Roadmap to get in front of an audience in their community. You know, mm -hmm. it, could be, um, it could be HR in a company or an employee assistance program saying this is a great tool for our employees to use for themselves and their um, parents. So let's do a workshop on it. It could be a senior center or some other local place. It could be a faith-based organization. It could be an elder law attorney's practice. There's just so many potential people who could deliver this. So we are actually in the process of creating some facilitator materials. Good. So creating a PowerPoint. Um, it's got the basics of the roadmap. It's got little participatory exercises where sure. people can go into pairs and talk about these things, group discussions, icons, um, just lots of things to make it simple. So we're trying to make it plug and play. So people like you, people out there in their communities can say, hey, I've got a ready-made program. Yep. I can deliver it in three hours, or if I don't have three hours, there's the one hour version. And I have little handouts for people. All sure. of that. So that's what we're working on a way to Good. get it more broadly disseminated. But we certainly do appreciate you and anyone else uh, who does podcasts, who are media, who can sure. help tell people about it too. So we're really thrilled that well, you have us on. Well, we, I, it's been a pleasure and we look forward to having you on again. I'd like to dig even deeper this is more of an introductory thing uh, for us to to introduce you to our um, our growing podcast listenership, and it's and it's nationwide, and so we're reaching everybody out there, and it's evergreen content, which means they get to view it over and over and over, and it's going to be on my site in perpetuity. So, you know, we're very very happy because we to have you on because this is a big issue, and it's an issue that I I am kind of a as you can tell, I'm just kind of brutal with my approach. I just ask people, hey, are you planning for cognitive decline? I mean, I, I'm pretty brutal with people. Um, and if they say no, I'm like, well, you need to, player, because it's going to happen to you. You need, We need to talk about it. Um, I know that's not the right approach for everyone, but um, it was important for me. So when Steve reached out and said, uh, said the, the topic, I'm like, absolutely do want to talk about that. We've kind of hit the, the end of the program, but what I do every single time, Steve's uh, used to this, so I'm going to throw it to him. Naomi, you get it the next time. But what I do is the mic drop moment, and the mic drop moment at the end is I throw the mic to Steve. He's going to be speaking for both of you on this, on on behalf of both of you. And the mic drop moment is just kind of words of wisdom, you know, a 30 second, a minute words of wisdom to people to to tell them, you know, why this is important, and just to tie this thing up, and I'll close this out. So go ahead, Steve. Well, uh, thank you, Stan, and thanks for having us. Sure. Uh, I'd say reflect, um, almost everybody our age has stories of older friends or family, parents, where something has happened like this. And so reflect on that. And what did, how did that make you feel? And um, use that, because for a lot of people, it, it generates some kind of fear or anxiety. Yeah. Don't be paralyzed. Use that fear and anxiety to motivate yourself. I'm gonna do something for me that not only is going to be good for me, but it'll give my family peace of mind. And so peace of mind, I think, is an important topic. Give yourself peace of mind. Give your adult kids, grandkids, your neighbors peace of mind that you are in charge and you're smart and you're taking care of this. You're proactive. You're a smart thinker. Um, that's the message is be smart. Be proactive. Proactive, I think, is the takeaway word from this um that i that i'm taking away but i want to thank naomi just fantastic to meet you um I, i'm smarter just being in the same podcast room with you steve <laughs> the same with you you know you guys are really really smart i really appreciate you being on the fun with annuities podcast the one of the fastest growing podcasts in the country for this reason we have real people on that are really smart and trying to help so i appreciate everyone joining us and i will see you next week 
Thanks for listening to Fun with Annuities. Please hit the subscribe button and make sure to go to my site at theannuityman.com where you can run your own SPIA, DIA, and QLAC quotes and see a live feed of the best MIGA fix rates in the country and even get indexed and income rider quotes as well. You can also sign up for my six annuity owner's manual books and I'll ship them for free and under no obligation. I also encourage you to schedule a one-on-one call with me, Stan the Annuity Man, so we can have a full discussion of your specific situation. It will be the best brutally factual and truthful advice you will ever get. And that's one guarantee you should definitely take advantage of. So join me next time for the number one annuity podcast on the planet, Fun with Annuities. Mm